In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Reverend Fathers, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. An instrument of a shameful death becomes for us the symbol of life. What was intended for humiliation becomes our only boast. What was intended to inspire fear instead gives us great courage. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, please God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. What does the wisdom of the world say to us today? It says to seek comfort, to seek luxury, to take it easy, you deserve it. Moreover, to listen to your own opinions, or those considered wise in this world. Don't struggle against sin. Don't bother. There's no point. And we certainly ought to despise, or at least to steer clear of, those who don't hold the right opinions, those of the other party, whatever party that might be. Such is the spirit of the world. But what does this wisdom of a worldly spirit in the church say? Something much similar, but with a more pious facade. It's quick to point out all the problems in the church, in other people, problems that are without fail someone else's fault. Others need to change, not me. It gives me a high standard, even the gospel standard, to measure everyone against, well, everyone except myself. It breeds distrust and division. It misplaces our attention onto world events and politics, church politics, parish politics, you name it. But there's one thing it certainly leads away from, and that is the cross of Christ. But what does the wisdom of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, say? If any would be my disciple, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The wisdom of God calls me to put aside my own comfort, my own interests, my own opinions for the love of him and my fellow man. The wisdom of God, and not just for the good of our fellow Christians, mind you, but for all people. We're called to acquire the same mind as Christ Jesus, desiring that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But it's no wonder the world considers this madness or foolishness. The wisdom of God is very far from any kind of philosophy of enlightened self-interest, but it's also very far from an abstract humanitarianism. It's very personal, very concrete. It's rooted in the desire that all of us be united in the kingdom of God, where the last shall be first and the first shall be last. It's rooted in the calling for me to love each and every person I meet, each concrete person who I have real interactions with, in my family, at work, at church. These are the very people I'm called to deny myself, my own selfish interests, and love with the love of Jesus Christ. Real people, not just an abstract greater good, that great martyr of the early 2nd century, Ignatius of Antioch, an apostolic father and direct disciple of John the Theologian, expressed all of this so beautifully on his way to martyrdom, under, already under arrest. I'd like to quote a little this morning from St. Ignatius to help us taste a little, of, to give a taste from someone who's taken up his cross and acquired the mind of Christ. St. Ignatius writes, I glorify Jesus Christ, the God who made you so wise, for I observe that you are established in an unshakable faith, having been nailed, as it were, to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, both in body and in spirit, and firmly established in love by the blood of Christ, totally convinced with regard to our Lord that he is truly of the family of David with respect to his human descent and Son of God with respect to the divine will of power. 
In other words, as we would say, fully God and fully man. Born of a virgin, truly, baptized by John in order to fulfill all righteousness, truly nailed in the flesh for us under Pontius Pilate and Herod the Tetrarch, and from the fruit of his divinely blessed suffering, we derive our existence in order that he might raise a banner for the ages through his resurrection for his saints and faithful people, whether among Jews or among Gentiles, in one body, his church. We feel in these words of this early martyr the living and life-giving reality of the cross. We, we one who witnesses that we derive our very existence from the fruit of our Lord's suffering on the cross. Not an earthly, ordinary existence, but the abundant life of the kingdom of heaven. And the two themes that follow from this, the fruits of the cross, are a striving for unity in Christ and a fiery love for all people, even his persecutors. St. Ignatius goes on to write, the cross and the resurrection were not an appearance, not a fiction, not a nice myth or fairy tale, but a life-giving reality of the experience. For Jesus suffered all these things for our sakes, in order that we might be saved. And he truly suffered, just as he truly raised himself. He goes on to call himself a man set on unity, writing, stay away from evil plants, which are not cultivated by our Lord Jesus Christ, because they are not of the Father's planting. For all those who belong to God and Jesus Christ are with the bishop, and all those who repent and enter into the unity of the church will belong to God, so that they may be living in accordance with Jesus Christ. Do not be misled, my brothers and sisters. If any follow a schismatic, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. If any hold to alien views, they dissociate themselves from the passion of Christ. Take care, therefore, he continues, to participate in the one Eucharist, for there is one flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ, and one cup that leads to unity through his blood, just as there is one altar and one bishop, together with the council of the presbyters and the deacons, so beautifully witnessed to today in order that whatever you may do may be in accordance with God. The unity of the church is manifested in our love for one another as disciples of Jesus Christ, unity by our common, united by our common faith in his suffering and death on the cross and resurrection on the third day, united around our hierarchy as a successor to the apostles and manifesting the unity of Jesus Christ in our midst. It is better for me to die, writes St. Ignatius, than to rule over the ends of the earth. Allow me to be an imitator of the sufferings of Christ. I take no pleasure in corruptible food or in the pleasures of this life. I want the bread of God, which is the flesh of Christ, and for drink I want his blood, which is incorruptible love. May we all want that too. Now the same St. Ignatius prayed that he might be accounted worthy to call his Roman persecutors his brothers. Imagine that. They weren't just his enemies. He says, may I be accounted worthy to call them my brothers. Let this mind also be in us, the mind of Christ. This is a crucified heart, a heart that has acquired the love of the cross, ready to deny oneself for the salvation of the other. Like St. Paul, desiring that he might even be cast off if it could mean the salvation of his people, the Jewish people. A disposition of the cross is one that gives, that offers, that sacrifices my own comfort, my time, my security, even my opinions for the sake of something better. From the cross, Jesus Christ forgave his tormentors, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. In the past year and a half, many people have become estranged from one another, in families, in our church family, among friends or colleagues at work. I sadly 
I've heard it said too often, and believe me, once is too often, that I no longer speak with or want to have anything to do with this or that family member or former friend because of their views on politics or COVID or vaccines or whatever it may be. We're living in a time when the love of many is growing cold and we must resist this through the power of the cross to still hope beyond hope, to be ready to give the benefit of the doubt, to be ready to forgive, to restore, to bear with one another in love. This is the power of the cross that is foolishness to the world, the power to create and recreate, to renew and restore, to move beyond the desire to return evil for evil and to value people as people and not based on their opinions. So let us, on this glorious and beautiful feast, we commemorate the historic binding of the cross, find and embrace the cross anew once more in our lives, strengthened and encouraged through our unity with each other, with the love of God and all people in the center of our hearts. To him who ascended the cross, that he might draw all people to himself and his heavenly kingdom be glory, together with his fathers from everlasting, and his all holy good and life-giving spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen.